All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tiffany Garcia, and I'm a librarian at the San Jose Public Library. Today uh, is the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and uh, we have partnered with the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Committee, who has helped us organize this event. We will be uh, remembering this legacy and hear from some of the new works of local social justice organizations. This program is recommended for teens and adults. And now I will go ahead and pass the spotlight to Jill, our city librarian. Thank you, Tiffany, and hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining the San Jose Public Library in our second annual virtual program to celebrate Dr. King's birthday and remember his legacy. Today's program would not have been made possible without the support from our partners, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Committee. Thank you for being a part of this program and for organizing such an amazing group of community leaders to speak today. Every year, the San Jose Public Library offers programs and events for people of all ages, whether it's discussions for adults or crafts for children. We provide these interactive opportunities because we understand the important contributions Dr. King made to the American Civil Rights Movement and to our history. Our staff works diligently to help inform and educate the public by providing not only programs and events, but also an extensive collection of both physical and digital materials related to Dr. King's life, activism, teachings, and achievements. Currently, we have more than 1,600 items for all ages across all platforms in this collection. And at the beginning of 2020, the library formed its first racial equity group and recently introduced the Equity and Inclusion webpage dedicated to highlighting services and programs such as anti-racism resources, accessibility, and LGBTQ plus information and resources. It can be found at sjpl.org slash equity inclusion. Part of the mission and purpose of this group is to create an environment that is welcoming and inclusive for all individuals, bring people together, build communities and enrich lives. This group also worked with a committee of cross-sector leaders to develop the city's first program quality standards for equity, diversity, and inclusion. If adopted by our city council, these quality standards would apply to all city programs that serve our dynamic, diverse public. As your public library, we stand with all people, celebrating color, background, immigration status, and invite communities to utilize our services. Join us in deepening our understanding of racism and systemic inequity, and reflect on the ways in which we can each contribute toward creating a more just and equal community. Thank you so much for your time today, and I'm gonna pass it back to Tiffany so she can introduce our next guest speaker. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Jill. And now, uh, Sharat Jilin, our um, uh, co-coordinator of the Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Legacy Committee. Sharat? Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Tiffany and, and Jill, for, uh, for welcoming us uh, uh, here and, and hosting this event. Um, and thank all of you for, for being here today. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm Sharat Jilin and uh, co-chair of the Dr. Martin Luther King Legacy Committee. And I also serve with uh, with Human Agenda, the Initiative for Equality, and and a few other community organizations. So I want to thank the the San Jose Public Library uh, for dedicating and naming the main library in San Jose in honor of Dr. Mark Luther King Jr. and for sponsoring this annual commemoration uh, of his birthday and and his uh, immortal legacy. This event is a collaboration between the library and the Dr. Martin Luther King Legacy Committee, which was founded by Dr. Oscar Battle when the, bat, when the library opened in its present location uh, in a joint project with, San, with the San Jose State University Library. Now, uh, today, when, you know, when we think of, of Dr. King, uh, we often think of this country's most famous uh, civil rights leader. Uh, we may think of his I Have a Dream speech. We may think of his tireless organizing, and we may think of his commitment to nonviolence. And uh, these are all true. They, were, they are well documented in, in the Martin Luther King 
Junior National Historical Park in Atlanta that I had a, had the pleasure of, of visiting recently. But this is a, a also a whitewashed Dr. King, whitewashed because while a post civil rights America was in desperate need for an African American national hero, it had difficulty accepting Dr. King's condemnation of systemic injustice, white supremacy, and war. So what is missing from, from those exhibits and memorials and the mainstream narrative is Dr. King's passionate call for equal economic opportunity for all, for abolishing poverty, for ending homelessness, for universal access to jobs and the rights of workers, and for systemic change for social justice. At the moment of his last breath on April 4th, 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee, Dr. King was mobilizing support for striking sanitation workers. Okay, so he was much more than, than, than just a, a civil rights leader. And that's very important, but, but he, was, he was much more. What is missing from the exhibits and memorials is Dr. King's unwavering opposition to not only violence, but militarism and war. His advisors and top aides had long been resisting uh, Dr. King's desire to take a, a public stand against the Vietnam War, fearing that such a stand would erode support for the civil rights agenda. On April 4th, 1967, exactly one year before his assassination, in his Beyond Vietnam speech at the Riverside Church in New York City, Dr. King announced his condemnation of the Vietnam War. This was fully a year before the big student mobilizations and strikes against that war. So he was, he, you know, he had this, this foresight. He was, he was really ahead of his time. What is missing from the exhibits and memorials is Dr. King's call for volunteerism and service. He would roll over in his grave if he came to know that his birthday would become a day off from work, a national holiday. But he would be much happier if we each took his birthday as a day on to engage in the greater work of service to the marginalized and oppressed, service to the beloved community, service to humanity. Addressing an audience in Montgomery, Alabama in 1957, King once said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? So that is the theme of this year's commemoration of what would be uh, Dr. King's 93rd birthday. What are you doing for others? Let today, not be a day off, but rather a day on. What are you doing for others on this day on? As we look around us, we see an explosion of inequality, homelessness, unequal access to healthcare, particularly during the pandemic, food lines, an explosion in the divide between the rich and the poor. Unfortunately, Dr. King's call to action is as relevant today as it was in 1957. And so we will hear today from some of the local activists, the change makers, who are answering Dr. King's radical call for doing something for others, for the victims of hate, for the unhoused, for the undocumented, for the frontline essential workers, like farm workers and food workers, for the victims of the unjust criminal justice system, for communities marginalized by our economic system, for the victims of war and occupation. So our, our, um, our first, uh, I, I'm, I have a great honor of, of uh, having all of these community activists here uh, who have really been out there in the, in the community and has really been a pleasure working with each and every one of you. Um, first is, is Kiana Simmons, and Kiana Simmons uh, I have known since the, since the beginning of the, of the George Floyd protests, and she is the president and founder of Hero Tent, uh, which was organized to support the protests after the death of George Floyd. 
It is one of the co-sponsors of the, of the pancake breakfast that feeds a, a healthy meal to those in need every Saturday morning. We've been doing this for, for almost two years. So, and, and of course, Eurotan has been doing so much more, but uh, uh, Kiana, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to have you here. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I really appreciate everything you said. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kiana and I'm a community organizer for, from Hero Tent, which stands for Human Empowerment Radical Optimism. And like Sharat was saying, I got my start in community organizing during the summer 2020 protests in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm here to talk about how the words of Martin Luther King Jr. moved me to resist and organize, and I urge you all to move with me. And Dr. King, Dr. King's famous words from his 1963, I have a dream speech. He says, I have a dream that my four little children will, will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. A generation was born, grew old, and the seed that Dr. King planted in his 1963 speech has yet to be watered and that dream has not grown. I'm the oldest of six and I'm scared for my younger siblings to exist in a world with black skin because I have seen the realities of living while black in America. Dr. King was fighting for so many of the same things that we are still organizing for now. I don't know about you all, but that makes me really angry and sad. For one weekend, this nation remembers the legacy of Dr. King, but it was this country that killed him, and it still kills Black men and women with impunity. George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, and so many more Black lives have been murdered by the American police state, pacified by the media, and ignored by politicians. Today, we are gathered to reminisce on the inspiring words of the amazing Dr. King. This weekend, the country is erupting with community service events in the name of Dr. King and his message to urge folks to get out in the community and serve others. What are you doing for others? I'd actually like to ask you all that question. What do you do for others? Specifically, what are you doing for Black people? What are you doing for Black people in your community? In San Jose, there's a population of less than 3%. There's a there's a less than 3% of, of Black people living in the city of San Jose, but 19% of unhoused people are Black. Gentrification has pushed the Black community out of San Jose and marginalized those who remain. One in four San Jose police officers have a complaint filed against them, and 23% of complaints are for use of force. Black people, specifically young Black men, are disproportionately detained and arrested for minor crimes and make up a disproportionate number of pretrial cases in our county jail. Police over patrol Black and Latino neighborhoods. And in the case of Demetrius Stanley, SJPD created the circumstance that led to his death and they now blame him for it. I'm also reminded of Gregory Johnson, a young black man killed at San Jose State University under at best mysterious circumstances. I have a dream too, that we can dismantle these unjust systems and create a community that cares for one another, where we don't look to punish and prosecute, but look to alleviate the root causes of crime, where we eliminate poverty and provide access to healthcare, education, and a future to all children, regardless of class or color. Even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. Thank you for letting me speak today. Thank you so much, Kiana. It, it, and it's been it's been a uh, very inspiring to to see the the next generation and a whole host of, of new organizations come up in the past two years. 
and and mobilize and in, in, in uh, you know in uh, along the lines of of Dr. King's uh, uh, legacy. Our next speaker is is Sajid Khan. Uh, Sajid Khan is a is a is a Santa Clara County Deputy Public Defender. He advocates for systemic change in a racist criminal justice system that has by far the highest incarceration rate in the world and disproportionately incarcerates people of color. And he's really been out there in, in the community and, and it's been a real uh, pleasure to, uh, to, to know him. So uh, Sajid, welcome. Thank you, Sharat, and thank you everybody for having me. Uh, thank you, Kiana, for that beautiful uh, speech and those beautiful reminders. Um, a few personal things first. It's a real pleasure to be hosted by the San Jose Public Library. I'm a, um, I'm born and raised here in Santa Clara County. I grew up in Milpitas and then moved to San Jose when I was in high school and spent many of my days and my weekends at the San Rose Garden branch of the San Jose Public Library. Um, and so it's really special to be here uh, being hosted by the San Jose Public Library. And then secondly, uh, Sharat, your words about Dr. King reminded me that I actually had the honor and privilege to go to Memphis, Tennessee in 2014, and I visited the Lorraine Motel where Dr. King was unfortunately assassinated. And then in 2018, I went to Atlanta, Georgia and visited Dr. King's uh, birthplace. And when I went there, I actually came upon some stamps that were issued by the country of India in the aftermath of Dr. King's assassination, honoring Dr. King. And I learned for the first time that Dr. King had actually visited India in the late 1950s as part of his, um, his intersectional movement for civil and human rights, not only here in the United States, but across the world. And I, as the son of immigrants from India and also someone passionate for manifesting civil rights here in the United States found such a synergy in knowing that Dr. King had visited my parents' homeland and uh, touched these, these very integral parts of my identity. Um, when we think about Dr. King, I think it's really critical that when we uh, seek to embody and manifest his legacy and his activism, uh, it has to start with our criminal legal system. The way we manifest Dr. King in, 2000, in 2022 is by committing ourselves to transforming the criminal legal system because as Kiana and as Sharat have already mentioned, it is the bedrock of systemic racism. It is where we inflict generational trauma on communities of color, specifically our black, brown, uh, black and brown brothers and sisters. It's where we separate families. It's where we cultivate ugly stereotypes about people of color in our country. And it is where uh, the harms of police brutality and excessive force uh, perpetuate and continue. And so I am urging all of you um, to commit to, uh, of yourselves to transforming the criminal legal system as your way of embodying Dr. King. And how do we do that? I'm gonna give three quick points. The first is a commitment to telling the truth, telling the truth about systemic racism, telling the truth about mass incarceration, and telling the truth about the impact that uh, our criminal legal system has had on communities of color. Brian Stevenson, who many of you may know, he said the following, I think it's really important that people understand that if you're genuinely engaged in recovering from human rights abuses, you have to commit to truth telling first. You can't jump to reconciliation. You can't jump to reparation or restoration until you tell the truth. Until you know the nature of the injuries, you can't actually speak to the kind of remedies that are going to be necessary. So I'm urging all of us to be truth tellers in the mold of Dr. King and in the mold of, of Brian Stevenson. The second point uh, that we all need to commit to is the full dignity and humanity of all people in our community particularly people of color. And I'm gonna quote a person named Vijay Prashad, uh, who I've uh, gained a lot of inspiration from. And he said the following. He said, when you say black lives matter, you surely don't just mean that the killing must stop. Surely you mean that the precious lives of human beings must have access to food, must have access to housing, must have access to education, healthcare, and the broad range of services. Surely it means that the whole preciousness of life, not that you should just be allowed to live. 
what's the point of living if I can't live with dignity? And so it's another critical point that when we say Black Lives Matter, it's not just to say stop killing us or stop batoning us or stop seeking dogs on us. It means a commitment to the full dignity and well-being of all of our fellow human beings. And then lastly, I will, I will urge all of us uh, to commit to moving away from defining justice and pursuing safety through policing, punishing, arresting, and caging our people. We have to move beyond uh, justice being measured by months in jail and years in prison. We have to move beyond that old adage of you do the crime, you do the time. As Kiana has already mentioned, we have to move forward and address root causes of harm uh, before harm occurs in our communities. And when it does occur, respond with compassion, with understanding, with wisdom, with care, uh, so that these harms don't occur again. And when we talk about addressing root causes of harm, we don't do that by caging and incarcerating people. We do that by providing robust uh, services that address, again, the full dignity and humanity and well-being of all our people, and thereby cultivating true public safety for all of us. I'll end my words uh, with the words of Dr. King, uh, who said, now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the, from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sajid. Yes, it, what you're saying is, is, is completely, completely correct. And uh, it's, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly something that, that uh, you know, Dr. King um, you know, wanted was, was for us to, to stop this, uh, this cycle and, and psychology of, of, uh, of punishment that we have to punish uh, our citizens uh, for every little infraction. Instead, we need to be going to the root causes of, of, uh, of uh, societal uh, discord. Our next speaker is, is Latoya Fernandez. And Latoya uh, is the founder of Youth Hype. She has been a passionate activist for, for Black Lives Matter and mobilizing and empowering youth for, for social justice activism. And she's another person whom I had the pleasure of, of meeting in the, in, uh, in the summer of, of, of 2020, uh, you know, mobilizing in, in the streets. And uh, she's another person who gives me great hope. So Latoya, take it away. Thank you, thank you. Um, just an honor to be here, uh, especially in the presence of so many powerful comrades. Um, I love y'all so much. So I just, just seeing your faces is so uplifting. And um, I really want to speak about what it truly means to be above oppression and really tapping in the young voices. Uh, you know, one of the beautiful things about Martin Luther King and his movement was that it was super, super led by young people. And, and, and it was, and, and here's the thing that I want to make a distinction about. It wasn't young people who denounced older people. It was young folks who, who took the wisdom from their elders and also along with that wisdom took the baton, right? They took the baton and then they took to the streets. And another great thing about MLK's movement with it being youth led was that they rose above the oppression. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, what we're going through, um, you know, we can't really compare the two, but, you know, let's be honest, a lot has changed since that time. We are, we, we are, we are dealing with a lot. Um, we're still uh, dealing with police brutality. We're dealing with systemic oppression, but we are not dealing with, with cer certain things that are on the magnitude of what that generation was facing. Yet they continue to show up in suits praying with and praying for those that were oppressing them. And I think that's important to point out when we're talking about MLK, he wasn't just an activist. He was a God led leader. And because he knew where his orders were coming from, that they were above himself, that they, they were coming, coming from the God that he served, 
he lived and moved with that sense of urgency and that sense of purpose and that sense of peace. And I think, you know, that's something that I took from, from MLK because my activism has had stages. Um, and I remember I used to be like, nah, I'm like Malcolm X. I'm not like MLK. Until I actually researched how MLK got started from a child all the way up through the ranks and realized he was radical. And, and, and the peaceful, the peaceful uh, path that he took was strategic. And we actually couldn't have the progress in the movement without both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Cesar Chavez. All three of the way that they the, the way that they did things, all the all three of those modes of leadership were necessary. And you know, I think I just want to point that out because I know like we get really excited and we, you know, we kind of um place, you know, one leader above all and say like that's the only way. But when I think about tapping into the youth, they need to know that they have access to multiple paths to leadership. And it's gonna look different for all of them. And so being a being being an activist in the community, it just comes from doing what you can when you can for as long as you can. I don't think any uh, anyone here, you know, I look at my comrades, I look at Peter and Sajid, and Kiana. I don't think any of us like woke up, you know, one day as kids and we're like, oh yeah, like we, we're gonna be activists and like go out and like change laws and policies. No, but something there were things going on around us that were not fair that were not right and those things caused us to have trouble sleeping at night and that caused us to not be able to exist in this world like everything was just fine and so it started with small things taking a step doing something being there just showing up for the community i know that's how i got my start i just started just showing up for people what do you need what do you need me to do where do you need me to go I, whatever it is i can pray with you i can get you food i can show you know and i think that's the biggest thing about what do you do for others it's gonna look different for everyone and referencing back to being another god-led leader because i'm i'm 100 percent about that god is giving me my orders that there are different parts of the spiritual body and each of those parts are just as important you need the eyes the ears the lips the tongue you need everything to make the body function and that is exactly how activism and social change work is is everybody has a role and it's not like one role is is more significant than the other but if we all do our part and we all are working together then we can really actually start to see these dreams manifest into the realities um, that that, doc, that Dr. Martin Luther King was talking about, and I think we're getting there. You know, I look at um, I look at the things that happened when the George Floyd protests broke out, and I saw how our community went out onto the streets. And as I'm sitting in this space now, this is an actual manifestation of the unity that was built out there. I mean, sure, I'm sitting here introducing this is an actual manifestation of what MLK was talking about this event that we're having right now, right? And so Peter running for city council, Sajid running for DA, Kiana founding a nonprofit that's taking care of the community. These are all manifestations. So I don't want us to get bogged down and like, oh, like we didn't, we didn't accomplish the dream. Cause guess what? I think MLK would be super proud right now to see us all, you know, different genders, different races, different backgrounds coming together to really put pressure on the system, which we did relentlessly for the past couple of years. And I think our lawmakers in San Jose and Santa Clara County in the state of California, they felt the heat. They felt the heat and they have been forced to change. And I think that is inspiring for the students that are coming up who just had to go through a pandemic, who lost family members, and now they're showing up in, in school and they're like, what's next? What's for us? And I think we need to not only give youth platforms, but we need to give them real resources and strategies for them to be present and effective at the table. It's not just enough to go marching in the streets with them angrily. Anger is a healthy emotion. But if we can't just be leading the youth out into a battle on the streets and then not showing them how to organize and sit at the table with people who can make these changes, not showing them what it means to get your education so that you can be the person that are making these decisions, right? And I think that's the biggest thing when I talk about like empowering the next generation. It's not like, oh, we're gonna tell you what to do. It's like, we're providing you a platform 
Here's some strategies. Here's some resources. And we're just going to back you up. We're just here to back you up. That's it. We're here to back you up. We're here to push your agenda. And I think you find if you start asking these youth, you start asking these students what it is that they want to see. They've got the solutions. Everyone keeps talking about this generation. Oh, they're so weak and they're so this and they're so that. No, nah, they're strong. And, and what's interesting about them is they understand that none of these social justice issues matter if we're not addressing climate change, if we're not addressing climate justice. They're like, it, race and gender, none of these things matter if we don't have a planet. So we need to start there. And that's what I love about them. They're just ready to do what needs to be done. So my challenge for everyone is, if you are not connected to students, you need to be. If you are out here wanting to, you know, make change in policy, make change in the community, make change in the communities and, and, and the cultures around you, you need to tap the young people in. You need to tap the students in. And I'm not saying put the movement on their shoulders by any means. But I'm saying invite them to the table and not just to tokenize them and say, we're here to listen to your opinions, but actually give them power. Give them the opportunities to vote on things. And I think California is a place that is progressive on some issues, but not progressive on others, which is really weird. And I think it's time, you know, to, to really start considering the youth in a real way. There are other places who have made it legal for youth that are 16 years old to vote and to be involved in policy in that way. There are youth that are writing resolutions that are co-authoring policies with, with state and federal legislatures. And I think that California can get there. Um, and I think that like, even if it just starts with like having conversations and, and finding out what their agenda is, I think that's where it has to go. I think that's where it has to go. So, you know, that is my call to action for all of you is to get the young folks involved and and to really um to close that gap between the older generation and the younger generation it is not a competition it is not a loss of power it needs to be a collaboration because the young folks need the wisdom and guidance from the older generation i i live with my grandmother right now and i talk to her at least two to three hours a day and that, that's critical so we need the guidance and the wisdom from the older generation. And then the older generation needs the energy and the fuel from the youth because they're also tapped into the, the issues that are rele relevant. So I think let's close that gap. Let's create more spaces where all generations can come together. And if you don't have youth at your table, you need to do that. It's time. So thank you all so much for having me in this space. It was truly an honor. Um, and again, I, I, I second the sentiment of let's not take a day off on, on MLK's day. Let's make it a day on, but let's not just make it a day. Let's make it a lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Latoya, for those, those amazing words, those really energizing words. And, and really, this is the, the recipe for, for moving forward is, is, is you know, passing the the baton and, and you know to the to the younger generation and but we have to work together and it has made a difference you know i mean i i i, I was surprised at the at the the latest uh, san jose city council meeting where they were receiving the the report of the of the charter review commission and i was amazed at, at some of the progressive proposals in that charter review commission report and believe me this would not have happened had it not been for the for the grassroots putting pressure, for the youth getting you know uh, having their voice and saying that this is what we want and 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 this is this is how we're we're creating a new community. Yeah. Our next speaker is Robert Aguirre, and Robert is is president of the Santa Clara County Homeless Union. He's been a passionate advocate and organizer uh, for the unhoused. Uh, most recently as an organizer of the of the annual memorial of unhoused people who have died in the in the streets and we had a record breaking at 250 deaths of of unhoused people on the streets in, in Santa Clara County last year and um, I've known Robert for many years and and uh, I, I, I'm I'm always fascinated at, at how 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 much I, I don't know about people but I uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to discover uh, how uh, we have these these amazing 
community activists who, who are doing so many things uh, and, and, you know, doing the service, doing what God, Dr. King said is, you know, serving the community. So, uh, Robert? Hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm Robert Aguirre, and I'm, um, I am the uh, president of the uh, Santa Clara County Homeless Union. I'm also uh, an officer in the California Homeless Union and the, also on the National Homeless Union. Uh, we have something like 40 chapters here in California, uh, all across the state. And, um, oh, start my video. Okay, I just got a message. Anyway, um, so I, I first like, thank you, Latoya, for, for your words. I really appreciate that. Uh, the one thing I would add to that is if you're going to mention Cesar Chavez, you have to mention Dolores Huerta. Because without Dolores, Cesar would not have been who he is. And I think we need to understand that leadership uh, can't only come from the men in our society, but the women are great contributors and they, they should be included at any, any time we can. Uh, I, I believe that the strength of that uh, Dr. King brought to the movement was inspired by uh, many of the women that were around him, the, uh, his, his, certainly his wife, Coretta, and uh, his, his family, and uh, other people that are around him that actually made his legacy uh, possible. When I was first considering speaking on this uh, panel, I started looking through a lot of his quotes, and I thought, well, let me see what it is that will inspire me. And then I suddenly came to the realization that I was already inspired by him. I had already been taking up the, uh, the fight, the action to uh, try to unify people, to try to get people to uh, stand up for their rights and uh, demand equality in, in the battle that we're in. Now, what I'm involved in is not so much racial. It is actually the only place where this battle exists that I know of that is non-discriminatory. That is that anyone can become unhoused. It takes very little for a person to lose whatever they have and find themselves living on the streets. Uh, and getting out of that situation becomes extremely difficult. It's a downward spiral and um, it takes all of us to together to try to help people get out of that situation. One of the things that, um, that inspired me about uh, Dr. King is that his, his ability to get other people involved so that the work was delegated, that many people were involved, uh, many other people were actually doing the work. His work and his work, as you mentioned, it was, was from God. And that, that's the, the position that he took. It wasn't him trying to get the glory uh, or the honor or anything like that. His whole thing was to get the movement going. So that's, that's pretty much what I do when I'm out there and doing the things that I do. And there are a lot of people that probably even on this, this, uh, this one conversation that know me, that know who I am, that know what I do. And, uh, and I don't know if they know why I do this, but I have been unhoused myself and I know what that experience is like. And I know that most of the problems that the unhoused people are experiencing are due to the hate that they see coming from people that are housed, people that feel that their properties have a higher priority than the lives of the people that are living out in the streets. You mentioned that 250 people died last year in the county of Santa Clara. It was 196 the year before. Five years ago, it was 68. How did we get to this place? How did we get to a place where we value property um, whether it's, it's a, a house or a, a bridge or an empty lot or wh wherever people are living, that that becomes a higher priority than the people that are trying to live on that. Why aren't we spending our money instead of trying to get Google to come in here and do all the things that Google wants to do? And eventually they're going to take over the city. I don't know if you realize it or not, but let's, let's use that money then to try to help the least of us. Because that's the, really the goal that we should be setting for ourselves is to try to bring that equality that Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King talked about, to bring that equality to everyone, regardless of color. He talked about how his children would one day be able to stand with people of all colors and, and be able to be treated equally. I ask for nothing less than that. And I think that we, what we need to do is understand that it does take all of us. We all need to have a hand. 
we need we each hold a piece of that puzzle and the, any single puzzle piece does not reveal the entire picture but once we all get together and put our puzzle pieces together we see the big picture and the big picture is the equality that uh dr king was talking about and that is what will lift up all the people that are experiencing uh houselessness i say houselessness not homelessness because Wherever you are is where your home is, and where you don't have is a house. You do have a home. So uh, that's why I use that term, and I don't know if you've noticed, but that's, that's the term that's used pretty much in City Hall and also the Board of Supervisors, because I brought that to them, and I explained that to them. And so now they've taken up that vernacular. And I, I want us all to do that, to be able to understand that these people that are living in the streets are the same as we. They have the same problems. They have the same uh, issues with themselves, their lives, the same barriers, with the exception of, of a house. They don't have a permanent place to live. They can't lock a door, walk away, go to work, come back and find all the stuff still there. Um, they experience the same sort of pain and grief and suffering that the rest of us suffer. They just have a little bit more of it because they don't have a safe, secure place to be. Now, um, I don't wanna talk for a very long time but I just want to say one thing, and this is my quote from me, is uh, don't do more than you can do, but do all you can do. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. Uh, what you're saying is, is, is so true. And, um, you know, speaking of, of the, different, the different pieces of the puzzle and, and bringing everything together, um, you know, there are, there are often many pieces you mentioned, for example, that that um, Cesar Chavez is one, only one piece of that, of that puzzle. And there was Dolores Huerta, and of course there was another piece, right? There was Larry Itliong. And, and so the, 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 the farm workers movement was not just about, about uh, Latino workers, it was about Filipino workers, and it was about, you know, it was about many different workers, of many different backgrounds. And they all, these are all pieces of the puzzle that, 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 that made it work. And it's the same thing. With uh, with social justice and, and everything that, that Dr. King worked for, um, our next speaker is is Brenda Zendejas, and Brenda is is vice chair of the Movimiento Democratic Coalition, and a passionate advocate and community organizer for the undocumented, and for building grassroots power. And I've had the pleasure of of meeting her and and, and being with her in so many. Uh, uh, protests and, and, and organizing events in, in, the, in the last few years. So Brenda, take it away. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. My name is Brenda Sendejas. I am the vice chair of um, Movimiento Democratic Coalition and I'm also a longtime Eastside advocate here in Eastside San Jose. Um, I, wanna thank, I wanna thank today the Dr. Martin Luther King Committee for inviting me to be here today and speak to you all. And I also want to thank the San Jose uh, Public Library for co-hosting this event. Um, Dr. Martin Luke's birthday is today and we're going to celebrate um, with great things that we're all doing in our community. Um, and I'm sure there's many more activists that are not here today um, that are out there right now doing the work. Um, I do want to say thank you to everyone here on this call for all your work and for putting in the work in your actions. Dr. Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Uh, the speech inspired many of us, even our dreamers right now, right? In our, all our immigrant community. Um, sorry. Um, we all share this dream and we all fight. We want equality. Um, we want to make sure that everyone, regardless of their race, gender, or immigration or economic status be treated equally and fairly and humanely. In my advocacy on behalf of low-income immigrants and families, I strive to ensure everyone has equal access to health insurance, the right to vote, a pathway to citizenship, education, and economic opportunity. We continue to wait for a pathway to citizenship. This is a fight that we're still continuing even today. It's been more than 20 years and we haven't seen anything that leads 
our immigrant community to a pathway to citizenship. We continue to wait for medical for all. So a lot of people in our community that are still uninsured, our undocumented community still waits for that. And we continue to wait for a right to vote in city elections and school board elections. And this is something that we're fighting actually currently right now and is being brought up at city council led by Magdalena Carrasco and Silvia Arenas. These are things that right now currently we are fighting. We haven't met these. These are goals I would say for this year and hope that we can. Our immigrant community has done a lot with this pandemic. They've been the, in the front lines, putting their health always above everyone else. When we were all at home in our computers, working or possibly even at work still. And they're still waiting. We can't just have 10 to 12 activists or 20 always leading this way. We need to continue as a community. We need to rise up and flip the tables. There are tables that are still oppressing a lot of these groups. Our Latino community is still being oppressed. Our brown community is still being oppressed. It's not as Latoya said, it's not like they used to be as it's bad. It's not, she's right on that. But we still have a lot of work to do. Um, American racist voter suppression laws have weakened our voices of the community of color. There's no democracy if we are not including everyone at the table. King was about actions, that I know everyone here is ready to do the work. Doing the work is not easy, and as King was criticized many times, we will be as well. They will tell us, wait for your turn, become legal, get in line like the rest of us, but we have to continue to push because these are the same things that they heard as well. And we're in 2022 and we're still continuing to hear these things. Today, I wanna to urge you all to join the fight. Let's hold his legacy and fight a good fight inspired by Dr. King. And like everyone here is saying, what are we doing? What are we doing for our community, for our brown community, for our immigrant community? for all our community, because immigrants, not only Latinos, we're talking about Asians, we're talking about Haitians, we're talking about a lot of community that comes into the US for that dream, the dream for a better life. Thank you all for being here today. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you for, thank you for those words. Uh, yes, so it is about building community and and doing it together and and uh, and I, this is this is what gives me such a great pleasure in in uh, assembling these speakers uh, for for dr martin luther king's birthday uh, our next speaker is emerald rubio and she's founder of try try healing and organized uh, some of the most powerful rallies against against asian hate uh, relying on community organizing rather than law enforcement as a means to keep the community safe. And I, I'm, uh, I've always been, you know, these past few years, as I said, I've been very impressed by the, 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 uh, the younger people, the next generation who have been organizing and uh, they, they have uh, uh, really demonstrated such, uh, such a depth of uh, understanding. It's not just passion, but understanding and, and maturity in, in organizing these these protests and then moving forward from there to to community service so uh emerald go ahead thank you so much um emotional roller coasters i i agree there's some heavy hitters in this room and i'm just like all right emerald get it together <laughs> but i woke up today with such gratitude because every day is another gift, right? It's another gift to make a difference, to take up space, to use your voice, to be a light to those around you. So like Shot said, my name is Emerald Rubio. Not only am I a community leader, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a wounded warrior with decades of trauma, collectivist healer, authentic therapist, community leader, and activist at heart. 
During this pandemic era, we have suffered through collective trauma of the ongoing racial injustices towards the BIPOC community, the rise in violent attacks in the API community, and systems that continue to fail marginalized groups. But when I look at all of these things that are just so messed up in the world, underneath all this hate, what I see is trauma. And we need healing and we need change. In Dr. Martin Luther King's monumental speech, he emphasized the rights of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. He dreamed of a time where we could work together, play together, struggle together. And we are struggling together right now and stand in freedom together. So in my life, I have chosen to use my voice, my gifts, my energy, my, my God-given purpose to fight for healing in this world. Healing within our bodies, within our relationships, within our families, within our communities, and even within these oppressive systems. I am a true believer of everyday activism. I am with most, I'm with you all. It's not just a one day thing. This is your life, right? I am a true believer of everyday activism and the roles the various roles that you play because it all starts from within. So for example, as a wife, I'm intentional with not continuing the generational traumas of abuse that was modeled in my childhood home, but rather creating a place of safety and love and belonging so that our children are allowed to thrive. As a mother, I'm intentional with not, of educating my children, you know, on the realities of what is going on in the world, but also modeling healthy relationships, body ownership, and sharing my experiences as a survivor of years of sexual trauma so that they are equipped with the knowledge and understanding. Because I, we can't, we can't protect them from all the atrocities in the world, but I can empower them on what to do as they are navigating life. As a wounded warrior, collectivist healer, and authentic therapist, I am intentional about creating healing spaces for sexual trauma survivors where we can heal in community, where we can learn to fight the justice system, where we can learn to create a life that we deserve and dream of, rather than living in that victimhood space. I am intentional of journeying alongside other people in their darkest moments so that they can experience healing in their family trees. As a community leader, I have efforts on the preventative side and the reactive side, because you're right, it takes both. We can't wait for these crimes to happen. We need to see what, we need to create influence while they are young. I'm intentional about creating change by calling out systems and modeling, educating, creating learning experiences on how we can do things differently. So for example, in March, 2021, I spearheaded this rally to shed light on the violent attacks in the APA community. I continue to use my voice at multiple rallies to shed light on sexual crimes and racial attacks that we are continuing to face. You know, and I think Latoya, you said, yes, we need to empower our youth. So yes, get, you know, during these rallies, giving them the platform, not just active, you know, not just listeners, but giving them the space to, speak their truth, giving them the space so that they can also come alongside with and organize and be active participants in this movement. You know, within corporate systems, I created learning experiences on embracing cultural identity, embracing cultural diversity so that we can create a place of belonging in the workplace. And school systems, I shed light on looking at our children through a trauma-informed lens rather than focusing just on the outside behaviors, because you know that that's just the tip of the iceberg. Sharing with them, teaching them how to honor their feelings, own their truths, teaching them how we can look out for one another, how we can protect each other because we're a family, regardless of color, race, background, we are a family. And as families, we need to protect each other and create safety in our community. Our children are living in a world where there is still fear, divide, systemic racism, fear of police officials, immigration policies that evoke fear, school to prison pipelines focus on compliance and obedience rather than meeting the needs for these children. 
when I ask them, what do they need? They want love. They want stability. They want to feel safe, to feel seen, to feel heard. That's all. You know, and in the legal systems, I continue to fight for policies and laws to pass so that sexual trauma survivors can come forward at any time without the time constraints. Because out of a thousand survivors, only five will gain legal justice. Sit with that. How long it takes for people to come forward, how long that people continue to suffer. In communities of color, it's shedding light on colonial mentality, struggles of immigration, you know, cutting off generational patterns and creating generational healing. So no, it's not just one day, it's every day. So in everyday life, let's be more intentional of not just fighting, but spreading love. Because hate does not drive out hate. Live out each day with love in hopes to create a type of change that Martin Luther King dreamed of. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emerald. Yes, it is, it is peace and love that, that we need. And uh, we need to recognize how our, the system uh, in this country, this, this super competitive system in this, in this country, and punitive system, creates this, uh, this trauma and um, we need healing and we need, uh, as you say, I mean, we need love, universal love, revolutionary love. Uh, our next speaker is, is Peter Ortiz and uh, Peter Ortiz is president of the Santa Clara County Board of Education. He advocates for the most marginalized communities in East San Jose and has always been present in community mobilizations for, for equality. I, I've, in the last uh, few months, I, I'm really amazed that, uh, you know, Peter has really been, been there uh, in the community. He's been present. Um, <laughs> I, even, I even meet him in, in, uh, in uh, demonstrations in Oakland, all around the Bay. So uh, it's amazing uh, to, to see people who are, who are really in the community and they're there for the community. 100%. So Peter, go ahead. Thank you so much, Sharat. Um, hello, everyone. It's an honor to be with you all today. My, as mentioned, my name is Peter Ortiz. I'm president of the Santa Clara County Board of Education. Uh, but more importantly, I've been a, a longtime community organizer in East San Jose for uh, close to about 10 years now. Uh, I want to thank the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Committee for inviting me here to speak at this commemoration, recognizing his life work. Um, it is a great honor. Uh, I also wanna thank the San Jose Public Library System for its work in championing literacy and access to educational resources for the greater public. If you know me personally, you know that I'm not your average uh, elected official. Uh, in fact, my story is very similar to that of the students I have committed my life to advocate for. I'm proud to be born and raised in East San Jose. I'm still living in the same community I grew up in, directly off of White Road. I'm being raised by a single mother. Uh, my upbringing was very much working class. And watching my mother struggle to provide for our family instilled in me a passion to wanna to bring about the betterment of working people so that future generations could have the opportunity to pursue their dreams, regardless of their zip code, uh, financial status, uh, and even nation of origin. I had a rough start in life and was impacted uh, at an early age um, by gangs. But thanks to mentors and community leaders, I community-based like the former Mexican-American community service agency and the Year Up program feel anger and frustration at the issues going on in our community and that through advocacy and groups mobilization we can take powerful steps to address these problems head-on. 
I ran for this role in elected office because I know that all kids have the ability to excel in education if they are given the resources they need to be successful and if they are surrounded by adults that honestly believe in them. All of our youth are valuable. There's no such thing as a bad student. No young adult is a lost cause and no child should be allowed to slip through the cracks. In more than five decades since uh, Martin Luther King's uh, death, many of us never learned that he was considered a, a troublemaker and, and labeled a radical by the larger public and even despised by the, the status quo. Uh, you wouldn't uh, know that by hearing some of the conservatives in office quote him you know, on, on Martin Luther King Day in order to uh, pander to, to, the, to, the, to our communities. Uh, but had Dr. King not been a troublemaker, he would have never organized the Montgomery boycott. And he never would have pressed for the integration of American society through marches, sit-ins, and other acts of nonviolent civil disobedience. And let us not forget that Dr. King spent time in the jails of Atlanta and of Birmingham as a response to his activism, displaying that for him in the face of systemic oppression, if the cause is just, no risk was too great. Since I started my journey in elected office, I have prioritized advocating for expanding access to early childhood education, organizing alongside parents, students, and teachers within my trustee area to begin to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. Calling in, direct, calling in for direct investment in mental health resources within the K through 12 education system and for the empowerment of our local parents so that they may better influence the decisions made in the schools of their children. Some of you may remember that last year before the state made it a graduation requirement, our county board became engaged in a public debate regarding our advocacy for expansion of ethnic studies. The phrase radical began to be tossed around at our local leaders. Let me be clear. I'm proud to share that the Santa Clara County Board of Education was the first governing board in this county to pass a resolution in support of ethnic studies. This led to the formation of a first in state ethnic studies initiative. 50 years after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, and the supporters of ethnic studies and those who wish to have cultural representation in the classroom are still being labeled radical in a progressive state like California. You know, it's moments like that where we need to take a stop and realize, you know, that we have come far, but as other speakers have mentioned, we still have a long way to go. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be unless you are what you ought to be. This is interrelated of a structure of reality. Too oftentimes, community leaders and, and advocates, we forget this. Every day is a chance for an act of service to others. And so it is important to do so not only on Martin Luther King Day, but year round. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Very true. Yes, it's, it is a commitment to service year round, every day, throughout our lives. Uh, this, is, this is the way we're going to make it, make it through this. It's an ongoing struggle. Uh, and thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, our next speaker is, is Samina Sundas. She is the executive director and founder of American Muslim Voice. And uh, since I've known her since 9-11, since and she has been a, a tireless advocate and organizer for friendship, unity, inclusion, tolerance, and community, and, and most recently, uh, mobilizing assistance for the, for the unhoused. So again, it's about, it's about community and service. So Samira, welcome. Thank you, Sharad. Uh, American Muslim Voice Foundation was founded in 2003. Our organization's mission is inspired by a Quranic verse 
Surah Hujrat 49.13, where God says, O mankind, we created you from a single pair and divided you into tribes and nations, so you may get to know each other, not that you despise each other. American Muslim Boys Foundation is striving to replace the culture of despair, division and violence with the culture of hope, inclusion and peace. I am sorry, Sharad, I'm going to correct your introduction a little bit. You said tolerance. That is one word that I hate. I hate, hate, hate. Human beings are not supposed to be tolerated. We are supposed to be cherished because God created us. We are supposed to be loved, supported, cherished, and respected. And that's what we are thriving for. Some people ask me, aren't you asking too much? Let us ask for the sky so we may get somewhere acceptable. So that is something that I believe in. What do we do for others? It's not what we do for others. It's what we can do for ourselves. Because I believe unless and until all of us are feeling safe and at home, none of us are safe and at home. So let us not just organize events and wait for something bad to happen so we could react. Build relationships every single day with somebody who doesn't look like you. That is my dream. So one day I'm hoping we will be talking about the weather and the movies, not who has been targeted, who has been beaten up, who has been put in jail. That is a dream that I want for our next generations. We have one creator, one humanity, so we need to focus on all of us. Let us not just limit to US. If a child is suffering in Yemen, Palestine, just, you know, any other place, Kashmir, Gujarat, any place, East Palo Alto, East San Jose, that we all should feel that pain. We need to do everything in our power to stop this war machine where all of our resources are wasted. You know, when uh, US was going to start the war in Afghanistan, I was interviewed and I told them, please do not waste our resources. Afghans would never let anybody rule over them, no matter what. They rather die than to let it happen. But, you know, nobody listens to a woman who grew up in Pakistan and came to US and just, you know, is a mom. I don't have any PhD to prove that I can say that and it's the right thing. But look what we wasted. If we had spent one hundredth of the money we wasted and empowered the women in Afghanistan and built some things that Russia destroyed so people can have jobs and education and everything, the world will look so much different. Yemen is just, you know, the kids, the human beings, they are suffering, but we are not worrying about them. It's the politicians who just, you know, decide which one to save and which ones not to save. Our streets should be full with right now for the voting rights. That's what Martin Luther King fought for. And even today, there are states who won't allow everybody to vote. So let us get to know each other every single day. Let us not wait for a disaster to happen. Let us just think, Jeff Moore is a black dude, but he's my brother. Sharath is somebody else, but he's my brother. Latoya, all these people. We are brothers and sisters. So let us just start behaving as that. I am proud to say my best friend in America is not just one African-American woman, but a whole family. And that's how I learned what blacks went through in this country. Because I didn't grow up here. I didn't know. So build friendships that would allow you empathy, understanding, knowledge, so you can just stand strong with them and love them and just, you know, sit down, watch movies with them, not just fight, but love, share a meal. 
you are all welcome to my events. You know that I will be more than happy to connect with all of you. Let us build a better world for us and our future generation. Thank you everybody who worked on this amazing program and making me feel a part of that. Thank you, Sharad. Thank you so much, Samina. Your, your, uh, your, always, your words are always so uh, inspiring and, and uh, thoughtful. And, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, so about the, um, about the, with the word tolerance, I, 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 what I would say is that, is that we cannot use the word tolerance alone. If, if, if that's all people talk about, that's not enough, right? It, it has to be about building community, about friendship, about, about love, community love. And it's the same thing with, with people who talk about, you know, we're in, there's a, a, a community that is in struggle and we say, we want to, to be allies. We want to be their allies. And I say, that's not enough. We have to be champions for mm -hmm. them, right? So, so it's about taking it a, another level up and, and that is what's going to build and, and sustain the beloved community. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Um, and finally, we have uh, Reverend Jethro Moore, uh, who is uh, I've known for many years and, and had the pleasure of working with him on, on the Dr. Martin Luther King Legacy Committee. And uh, he's, uh, he's the past president of the NAACP of San Jose Silicon Valley. Uh, he was a, a commissioner on, on post, the Peace Officer Standards and, and Training Commission for the state of California and, and many other roles that he's played. And uh, only recently I, I, I learned that, that because, you know, here in California, or particularly in San Jose, we have these sky, we, these sky high housing prices. Reverend Moore uh, could not afford to to stay here and he had, to, he had to go to Atlanta, but he's still with us. He's still a member of our community. That, that's the beauty of this. And uh, so uh, Jethro, take it away. <clears throat> well, thank you. And I thank everyone for having me. And if I could just pause for a moment right now as we take in consideration uh, Congregation Beth of Israel in Colette Valley, Texas. Uh, as you might not know that they're currently having a hostage situation so we just pray that the best will come out of that and that everybody will be released back to their families and found safe and out of harm's way. And to my good friend, uh, Robert, man, I'm, I'm always thankful for that night that we were out late that night and uh, it got cold. As I said, you gave me your jacket off your back to keep me warm as we protested in front of San Jose State or regarding the homeless situation for San Jose State students. And you asked the question of what was happening. I wanted to answer it according to King. He says, I am convinced that we are to get on the right side of the world's revolution. We as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing oriented society to a person oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the triple giants of racism, extreme militarism, and materialism and material uh, materialism is capable of being conquered. That's what we must face right now. And that sermon delivered on August 11, 1957, Dr. King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? What legacy will we leave for those who come after us? A society grows great when an old man plants a tree whose shades they know they shall never sit under. In remembrance of King, what will be your response to life's most persistent and urgent question? Not a day off, but a day in service to honor Martin Luther King Jr. and to empower individuals, strengthen communities, build bridges, and create solutions to social problems. By spending time working together to improve our communities, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. King stated that an individual is not 
begun to live until he has risen above the narrow horizons of his own particular individualistic concerns to a broader concerns of all of humanity. We must fight self-centeredness, find some great causes and some great purpose, some loyalty to which you can give yourself, become so absorbed in that something that you can give your life to. King also said that every person must decide at some point whether they will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destruction and selflessness, which will you be? Robert displayed selflessness by giving me his coat that night. We endeavor to rise above the narrow confines of individualistic concerns and commit ourselves to making a difference for the betterment of Santa Clara County at large and within the communities in which we live. So we have that question, the love of humanity, versus the love of money. Which one will you choose? We're all benefactors of the deeds and contributions and sacrifices of those who went before us. They've left their mark. We enjoy the fruit of their labels that is incumbent upon us. Therefore, to leave a mark on the greater contributions to the betterment of this society, what are you doing? Not a day off, but a day on in service. To whom much is given, much is required. The freedoms and privileges of our citizenship, along with the right to pursue our dreams, are gifts of unmeasurable proportion. With this gift, what are we going to do with it? We is the most important word in the social justice vocabulary. The issue is not what we can't do, but what we can do when we stand together. With the upsurge in racism, hate crimes, criminalization of young black males, sensitivity to the poor, educational genocide and the moral economic cost of war. We must stand together now like never before. The Torah says, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole of the Torah. Let me ask this question, says, if an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you see that you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. If you remain neutral in situations of oppression, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So where do you sit? With all that we see happening in Santa Clara County today, where are you sitting? Are you just neutral? Or are you taking a stance? Overcoming unprecedented virus of voter suppression, the elimination of manifestations of racism, xenophobic, related intolerance to the administrations of justice right now. Long and costly, but the requires political. We must arrive above this political chaos, above all the in order to carry convictions. We must research the phantoms of your heart to understand what is right and just to do. This day, MLK, honor his memory by giving back to the community. There are many places and many things that we can accept and to volunteer to do today. Service is defined as an act of helpful activity, help aid someone. We must use technology to push back against the myths and the lies that are important. I suggest we begin with neighborhood planning units, NPUs, where, where as we come to this new election cycle, let these local neighborhoods in East San Jose or, 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 or over there in the woods, uh, um, let them come together, put what do they want. And so when the politician comes up and saying, vote for me, you give them what you want them to do. And if they can sign off on that, then you support them to vote. But if they can't survive, sign off on what that neighborhood won't, don't vote for that candidate. We are facing a fearless future. If we put our face, our trust in the Lord, while the world around us may struggle to keep pace with ever-changing moral and ethical landscape, those who are called according to his purpose will radiate with the presence of God. We will illuminate the will of God. We will reflect the image of God. We will reveal the word of God. We will shine with the righteousness of God. And we will spotlight the son of God because we are the glory of God. Sometimes amid the clamor and chaos, the pressure and the prosecution in our daily lives, we lose sight of God's enabling power, and we wonder if he sees what we're going through. But his word says, fear them not, therefore, for there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hide that shall not be known. No matter how it looks, we live with the promise that God is in control, 
and has the final word. The future may seem bleak, but those who love the Lord face a fearless future, a future that upholds the standards of morality and decency, a future that extends the hands of compassion and caring, a future that reflects God's message of grace and mercy, a future that reveals the hope of forgiveness and salvation, a future that proclaims the blessings of God's love, his joy, and his peace. We may be threatened, but we will endure. We may be intimidated, but we will not change. We may be assaulted, but we will not fail. We may be attacked, but we will not retreat. We may be slammed, but we will not be silent. For the future is written in God's justice and comfort and glory. And if we hold to God's unchanging hand, we will live in peace. We may encounter hardship, but David said, the Lord liveth with who redeemed my soul out of all adversities. We may have faced persecution, but blessed are ye when man shall revile you and persecute you. We may endure pressure, let the peace of God rule in our hearts, to which also we are called in one body, and be thankful. We will advance in spite of adversity. We will triumph in spite of criticism. We will, will rejoice in spite of opposition. We will prosper in spite of persecution. Why? Because we face a fearless future. We must continue to speak truth to power, stand tall in the words of God, and believe that he is on the side of the oppressed. No matter what faith and religion that you come from, know that he stands behind you, ready to raise you up, and to give you the strength to press on through this next voter suppression. And as I look at the history of our world, it was 1930-something when um, the Nazi party did a display in New York. Come to find out, as Frank, Frank FDR is running for his third term, he um, faced opposition from, from oil men who got money from Nazi Germany, from Hitler, to overthrow FDR. We're not taught that in our history books, but the same thing the Soviet Union tried to do here recently is the same thing Hitler did a few years ago. And we must be very mindful in this coming election that just because of hashtag 45, has been pushed to the side. He's not done. And he's coming back with a vengeance. And we must prepare as a community in unity to stand together, to stand up to this white nationalism, this white hate stuff that's going on out here and say no more. We are not going to tolerate it and we're not going to have it. Stamp it out wherever it's going to be. And let me just close with warning you. I know I'm over. I'm sorry. But we got this sheriff running for the, somebody's going to be running for election for sheriff. And you must understand, there's a person that just threw their hat in the ring that represents the police regime that you just got rid of. You must make sure that individual does not get in that sheriff seat. Thank you for having me. I hope everything's all right. God bless. Thank you very much, Jeff. Those are some amazing words. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, with the struggle goes on, and uh, and we must stand strong. We must stand strong as a community, and and uh, and move forward together. I want to uh, close with the a reminder about the you know Dr. King's uh, uh, notion of of injustice and, and injustice and injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. So we must stamp out the, those injustices wherever they happen, even if they're not in, you know, in, our, in our backyard. And uh, well, uh, I, I really have to thank each and every one of these amazing speakers. This has been uh, a really, really uh, amazing gathering and, and uh, thank you for the inspiring words and thank all of you uh, in the audience who have uh, attended, and um, um, I didn't have a lot of time to to put this this program together, so it's, it's a bit simpler than the ones we've had in the past. But uh, I, th I think it it gets the message across, and it it's a it's a statement of of our unity, of our commitment uh, here uh, in this in this community in in San Jose and, and Santa Clara County and the South Bay. So uh, with that, uh, I wanna thank uh, um, and, uh, the, the library again, 
and uh, turn it back over to Tiffany. Yes, I just wanted to give a sincere thank you again to all of our guest speakers, especially talking about your work and your organization's work. We really appreciate it. It was a very special program to commemorate Dr. Martin Luther King. And uh, we loved hearing um, how your organization is uh, living up to Dr. King's legacy. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, we hope you have a great day and that you learned something new today. So thank you so much. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining me in the San Jose Public Library. Please take a few minutes to fill out our program survey. For a complete list of other virtual programs, please visit sjpl.org forward slash virtual programs. Also, don't forget to follow us at, at San Jose Library on Facebook and sign up for their newsletter at sjpl.org forward slash e-newsletter to stay informed of all things SJPL. Have a great day.